we are back and we are looking at our fancy high frequency version of the Gloston Milgram model. And we're looking for the equilibrium of this model. So we have just decided that uh, fast traders with the highest expect with the highest valuation will always buy the asset. And the fast traders with the lowest possible valuation will never buy the asset. And we have devised the uh, pricing strategy for the dealer, depending on the, all the remaining on all the remaining strategies. So we are left to uh, find all of the others, and here we are running into a slight problem. This problem is that our model will have multiple equilibria, and this is not an artifact of the model, but. Is the thing about markets that markets often have several equilibria themselves and uh, it's very easy to jump from one equilibrium into another a lot of the um, a lot of these um, the, the, the the quantitative the quantitative easing measures after the great recession of 2008 were aimed at uh, jumping the where were directed at forcing the global economy to jump from an equilibrium with high savings and low consumption to the other equilibrium with high consumption and slightly lower savings. So this model has multiple equilibria and this has to do with the um, form of a self-fulfilling expectations. And expectations here matter for the dealer. So if the dealer expects to see a very, very high proportion of informed traders, then the dealer will set a very wide spread. This wide spread, in turn, will um, make slow traders, will make uninformed traders less willing to trade, which will, in turn, lead to only fast traders remaining in the market. So once again, if the dealer thinks that there are, there are a lot of informed traders, then there will be a lot of informed traders in the market. This is one self-fulfilling equilibrium. And vice versa, if the dealer expects to get a lot of uninformed traders, then the dealer will set a um, relatively narrow gap, relatively narrow spread, which will in turn attract these uninformed traders. So we'll have this in this model. Uh, to mitigate a little bit the problem, to uh, to narrow down the possible cases that we can have, we'll make this assumption on parameters. Uh, we'll assume that epsilon is greater than delta, which is greater than epsilon over 2. So what does this mean? Recall that epsilon is the standard deviation of v, and delta is the standard deviation of y, the private valuation. So what this says is that uh, the fundamentals are more important than the private valuations, which is uh, something that you would think is reasonable, right? But this is not to such an extent that completely overshadows these private valuations. So this first inequality, in particular, uh, does require that private valuations also matter. They are important for the decisions. So under this assumption, we will have a, v a ranking on the values that different traders assign to the... Um, the different traders have for the asset, depending on their private valuations and the news. And this ranking will look like this, right here. So we have already said that fast traders with good news and high private valuation have the highest possible valuation for the asset, while fast traders with uh, bad news and low valuation for the asset have the lowest possible valuation. Now, with the assumption that we just made, we also have that Slow traders with high uh, private valuation value the asset more than 
fast traders with um, good news and low valuation. So they have somewhat conflicting valuations. They know that the asset is worth a lot, um, that the fundamental value is high, but they just it does not fit their portfolio, right? So these fast traders are not super eager to trade. But the fact that V matters more than uh, Y means that these traders, uh, fast traders with good news and low private valuation, value the asset more than fast traders with bad news and high private valuation. So again, the fundamentals matter more than private valuations. Okay, so we have this ranking. And um, we will focus on pure strategy equilibria. We will have enough of those already. There will be some mixed strategy equilibria as well. And I'll tell you about those. Uh, so we can talk about three different equilibria. We'll call them P1, P2, and P3. The next slide derives or tells you how these equilibria look like um, in terms of well, more math. I will instead uh, use, do this using the drawing. So we'll say that this is our axis of price and these valuations in the mu, the exante valuation, um, are the points on this line somewhere. So what are the possible equilibria that we might have? One equilibrium we might have is that the ask price is somewhere here and the bid price is somewhere here. So they should be to different sides of mu. Let's say that the spread is very narrow. What happens then is that these three types of traders will all buy the asset and the other three types will all sell the asset. So fast traders with good news will buy the asset regardless of their private valuation and slow traders will buy the asset if their private valuation is high. So this is exactly what we will call P1 equilibrium. Other possible equilibria, other case that might happen is we might have an ask price here and the bid price here, which will then mean that Fast traders will only buy the asset if they have good news and high private valuation. And uh, slow traders will still buy if they have high uh, private valuation. But we are driving out of the market the fast traders with conflicting uh, signals. So if the fast trader has good news but low private valuation, they will now not trade because the spread is too wide. The ask price is too high to buy and the bid price is too low to sell. And the same applies to the fast trader with bad news and high private valuation. This is what we will call the P2 equilibrium. And finally, as you can already guess, the P3 equilibrium is the one with this ask price and this bid price, so that only the fast traders with extreme valuations get to trade. Fast traders buy if they have good news and high private valuation, while slow traders are now exiled of the market. So this is kind of the self, self-fulfilling part. The difference between this equilibrium, which we will call P3, and the other two is that here, uh, in this equilibrium, the slow traders are driven out of the market, meaning all the order flow comes from fast, from the informed traders. And um, this does generate a wider spread, which in turn drives slow traders out of the market. This is opposed to uh, P1 versus P2. Right, so if we compare P1 in which ask price was this and P2 in which the ask price was this. Uh, as we move from P1 to P2, we are driving the fast traders out of the market. 
which means that uh, the order flow becomes less informative, so the spread should actually get lower. Uh, so this is not a case of this um, multiplicities, multiplicities stemming from self-fulfilling expectations. This is rather a multiplicity that stems from a different equilibria that can arise under different parameter values. So what I mean here is that for some parameter values the, we might have a P1 equilibrium and P3 equilibrium, while for other parameter values we might have P2 and P3. But uh, I think P1 and P2 cannot coexist. And one thing that I've alluded to is we can have a spread so wide that there will be no trade in the market, and I've alluded to this as uh, the boring equilibrium. You can call this P4 equilibrium. And this, um, it will be substitutable with P3. In the same way that P1 is substitutable with P2. But now the more I think about it, we will actually never have an equilibrium. Yeah, we will not have an equilibrium in which no trade happens. I will not tell you why this is. I might make this a... No spoilers. So, okay. P1, P2 and P3. Three different kinds of equilibria that vary in who trades in the market. Um, so P3 equilibrium will always exist. This is something you can show. P1 equilibrium with the narrow spread is not guaranteed to exist. So what is the heuristic for when the P1 will exist? What do we need for the spread to be narrow? From Gloucester and Milgram, once again, we know all the intuition. This intuition says that for the spread to be narrow, we should have little informed trading. So we should not have too many informed traders in the market. And this turns out to translate perfectly to this case. In particular, okay, we have it here. Uh, P1 equilibrium exists if, I guess only if it should be, alpha is below a certain threshold. So if there are not too many informed traders in the market, if there are not too many fast traders in the market in this um, in this formulation. So this slide goes through the derivation of this threshold on alpha. It is too similar to Gloss and Milgram model. Um, I, we, we do not get much new knowledge from deriving this, so I'll skip it. And uh, you can similarly derive existence conditions for P2, for when P2 equilibrium will or will not exist. But one thing to note here is that whenever P1 exists, it is Pareto dominant. So it is weakly better for all agents than P3. So this is our implicit point of comparison. P1 is Pareto dominant to P3. Uh, just a quick note of how this happens. Dealers in our model are indifferent because they always break even, they always get zero profit. So we only need to look at traders. In P1, everyone gets to trade fast and slow, and they all get to trade at better prices than in P3. So in our model, now everyone is strategic, so uninformed traders are no longer trading at a loss, so they are trading only if it is optimal, so it is always better for them to trade than not to trade. Meaning P1, in which everyone is trading, is better than P3, in which uh, very few agents are trading. 
Okay, let us look at the profits. So from this point onwards, suppose that P1 equilibrium exists. How does um, how do the outcomes in this equilibrium depend on alpha? So let us compute the profits of fast and slow traders. We begin with fast institutions. Again, we are assuming that they are willing to buy, that uh, we are at the buy side of the market, which means that their profit is U, their private valuation for the asset, which is V plus Y, minus the price that they paid for the asset. So this ask price is something we have already computed to be like this. And um, in the case, in, in, in P1 in particular, we know how strategies of all traders look like. So if we plug those betas in the big expression that we had, it will simplify to this. On the other hand, the expected value of U, conditional on the fast institution trading in a P1 equilibrium, is what? So in P1, fast institutions trade when they have good news, and this does not depend on their private valuation Y. Meaning that expected value of U conditional on their decision to buy is mu plus epsilon. They know that V is high, that mu is plus epsilon. They do not know whether they get plus or minus delta. On average, they get plus delta half the time, minus delta half the time in private valuation. So this conditional expectation reduces to mu plus epsilon. And if you simplify it further, you get that their expected profit is given by this expression. One thing to note about it is that it is decreasing in alpha. So this expected profit is decreasing in the share of informed traders already in the market. So our fast institution suffers from having more fast competitors in the market. And this is pretty reasonable, right? Once again, just paralleling the intuition to Gloston Milgram model, the more informed traders you have in the market, the wider is the spread. Wider spread means worse prices. Worse prices means lower profit. So the fast institution wants to be the only fast institution in the market. It would rather not have anyone else. Moving on to slow institutions, we can do all the same manipulations. We will have the same ask price as we just had. The expected private valuation U, conditional on the slow institution's decision to buy, is mu plus delta. Why? Because slow institution does not know V, but it only decides to buy if its private valuation Y is positive, is high, is equal to delta. So they get mu plus delta and then plus or minus epsilon on average. If we re reduce this, we will obtain this expression, which is also decreasing in alpha for the very same reason. More informed fast traders in the market, the worse is the price. And then at some point, um, when this expression crosses zero, this is when P1 equilibrium stops existing. No, it's actually much faster than that. Never mind that. But yeah, at some point, when alpha is high enough, P1 equilibrium stops existing, and this is worse for everybody, as we just established. So in the end, all the profits are decreasing in alpha here assuming that we are in P1 equilibrium whenever it exists. So, being fast imposes an externality on everyone else. One thing to note is that um, being fast is, of course, better. So, profit of fast traders, phi, is greater than the profit of the uninformed traders, psi, the slow traders. And this difference, if I compute it correctly, is independent of alpha. This means that everyone, all traders want to be fast, 
but they want no one else to be fast. So this is tragedy of the commons. Something we all know and love in economics. Yeah, I guess there are two dimensions to this effect. We have covered them both. Within the P1 equilibrium, if it exists, higher lambda leads to more adverse selection. Because higher lambda means more informed traders in the market, right? But then at some point when P1 stops existing and we have to jump to P3, uh, what happens is this jump, which we think is due to alpha growing, this jump in lambda led to slow institutions leaving the market. So once again it leads to more adverse selection in the market, but now not due to more informed traders, but to less uninformed traders, crowding out of uninformed traders. Okay, yeah, moving on. Um, if you remember, we also had period zero in which every investor could choose to become fast or to remain slow. So if we think that there is some cost to this, <clears throat> some cost to becoming fast, in what we just, um, in the model that we've just seen, once again this benefit of becoming informed it does not depend on the number of informed traders in the market so the only two cases that we, that we could have is either everyone becomes informed becomes fast sorry or nobody does if the cost of doing so is too high so we have these two radical cases and um i guess the authors were not satisfied with this dichotomy so they um build an extension on top of the model to generate some kind of interior solution. In particular, they say that there is a, that there are a lot of markets, a lot of different markets to trade in, not just one. Sorry. Um, yeah, a lot of markets to trade. In particular, there is a continuum of markets and the size of this continuum is n. Meaning you can think of there being an um, interval from zero to n, and for any any real number in this interval denotes a a market. So we they also assume that institutions are heterogeneous. So even at the beginning of period zero, they have different types. Every institution has some type n. And this type determines how many markets the institution can participate in. So this is a kind of a size of the institution, the amount of resources they can devote to monitoring all the different markets. So this type n can be from, uh, this type small n can be between zero and large n. And we assume that it is distributed exponentially. Not exponentially. I guess hyperbolically. So the CDF of this distribution is given by this big N divided by small n. And so basically the size of the institution will determine the, will scale the profits of this institution. The idea behind this model is that you incur cost C only once for all markets but then your type N determines, uh, well, how many times you can enjoy the benefit of being fast. In how many markets you can be fast, you can profit from being fast. Meaning that in this model, in the end, uh, the large institutions, those with high end that could participate in many markets, will choose to become fast and slow institutions, uh, sorry, small institutions will remain slow. So this decision, more formally, will be driven by this inequality. 
So the profit from being fast is given by phi of alpha per market. And alpha is the total number of um, informed traders. In general, you think that this um, Sorry, I just realized that the order here is suboptimal. Uh, this inequality already assumes that your profit from being fast is the same in all markets. And I guess it is true. Um, yes, but it depends only on the total share of fast institutions, period. So it does not depend on which institutions chose to be fast. So this inequality already assumes some equilibrium structure. So this alpha kind of loses information on whether small institutions are, are fast or large institutions are fast. So I guess this already incorporates uh, what I just told you, that only institutions above a certain cutoff in terms of type N will choose to become fast. Sorry if this was confusing. Okay, so let's say we have this information from alpha. We can compute the per market average expected profit if you are fast and you will receive this expected profit n times if you are type n but to become fast you'll have to pay this one time cost c while if you are staying slow you will get profit psi of alpha per market and you will get it n times because you're participating in n markets so this condition is equivalent to this inequality meaning as i told you n being above a certain cutoff Yeah, this is really bad. This is a bad way of writing it. In, in, in writing this expression, we already assumed the result that we obtained. This is not good. I've got to fix it at some point. Yeah, so, sorry for the pause. I'm, I'm deciding whether I should read it or not, but uh, given that pause, I could have already read all of it. Uh, that's the problem. Okay, so one thing to notice here is uh, due to the particular shape of the distribution that we assumed, due to this particular shape H of N, um, it will generate the uniform distribution of trader types across markets. So in every market, um, we are assuming, yeah, that these n markets that each trader can partic participate in are selected randomly from the big continuum. So in every market, you have few large investors. So if n is large, h of n is small, right? I recall that h of small n is big n divided by small n. So you have a few investors that are large, that are almost in every market. So you are likely to see them in every market. And there are many small investors total, but because they are small, the probability of seeing them in a given market is somewhat smaller. So uh, there is a lower chance of encountering them. These two kind of uh, effects compensate each other due to the exact f uh, shape of H of N that we assumed, meaning that in any given market, the bottom line is the distribution of N you are facing is uniform from zero to N. So the... Um, the last piece of the puzzle that we have left is establishing the this alpha, right? The probability of informed trading in every market. And this alpha is the share of fast traders in every market. So it's equal to the probability, effectively, of n being above this cutoff n of alpha that we just derived, right? So the probability of facing a trader which is large enough 
for it to be worth it for this trader to become fast. And due to the uniform distribution, this probability is given by this expression. So this is 1 minus CDF of the uniform distribution. And this is exactly alpha. This is exactly the probability of facing a big enough investor for him to be fast in a given market. So we can solve this for alpha. And we would need to use this expression for n of alpha, which in turn, in turn depends on these profits, which depend on alpha. So there is a lot of algebra behind it. And in the end, what they find is uh, the authors find an equilibrium in which alpha decreases with the cost of becoming fast. So the, the costlier it is to become fast, the fewer fast traders you will have in the market, which is something very, very intuitive, something that you would expect, right? They also have a welfare result. And they say that if rho is greater than one, one half, meaning that the slow investors do not have that much trouble finding trading opportunities, then welfare maximizing value of alpha is zero. Right, so if we go back and recall, there were two benefits from becoming fast. So benefits from getting fast. One thing is you get to learn V before everyone else. And secondly, you get uh, more trading opportunities. So you find a trading opportunity for sure rather than with probability row. What this result says is that if this second channel is not too important, so if this benefit to getting more trading opportunities, which is in general welfare enhancing, right? Because once again traders want to trade, it's in their blood, it's in their nature, so they want to get more trading opportunities, and this is better for everyone. Um, but if this channel is not too important, if getting fast does not give you much more trading opportunities, then the only real consequence of getting fast is you get to learn V, which exacerbates the adverse selection in the market. And this makes it worse for everyone. Right, so what this result basically says in the end is that markets with no adverse selection generate more welfare than markets with adverse selection, which is um, something that we generally, generally know. So they can interpret it as uh, in well-functioning markets, equilibrium has too much high-frequency trading. Because in equilibrium, some traders do choose to become fast, while um, the, the welfare maximizing way is uh, setting alpha to zero. Okay, so this was the first paper by um, Bies et al. I have five minutes left for today. I don't think I have time to cover the second paper today. It's not too long, and the model is pretty simple, but five minutes is definitely not enough. So I think we will stop here for today, and we will cover the second model at the beginning of next week. So it also has to do with high-frequency trading, and the idea is pretty much the same. So they say that there is an arms race in H of T. Everyone wants to become fast at the cost of everyone else, at the expense of everyone else. And this paper would uh, propose to replace the continuous auction that actually happens to, that most markets is here to today with some frequent batch auctions so instead of continuous trading they will do batch auctions yeah every um, every now and then and just to be clear the proposal that they're making is that they should run batch auctions every 0.1 of a second so it will not create significant delays for anybody, 
but it will really probably hurt the high frequency traders. So we'll do this next week in greater detail. This paper is semi-empirical, so we'll also look at a bit of a data, and uh, it's got a very nice idea behind it. But we will stop here for today. If you have any questions, uh, you're welcome to ask them. Once again, sorry if this was uh, on the more confusing side. Uh, yeah, I wanted to include all the recent things, and so I had a bit less time to prepare everything else. But thank you for sticking around. Hope it was not too bad. And I'll see you on Friday for our exercise class. Stay safe and take care.